Okay. Yeah, this uh, this backdrop. I'm a mid century uh, freak, you know. And yeah, mid century I, modern is cool. I went to the Brady Bunch house recently. It was for sale. I know. I saw that. Yeah, it was for up for like five million, and then they sold it for three million. But it was crazy to be inside there. I don't know how old you are. Oh, I think you're forty six. I'm fifty seven. I grew up with Brady Bunch. Most people did after school. You come home and watch it, and then to be right. in that house, you could just hear all the sounds like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. I think it sold again. I think it sold a second time as well. Yeah, it sold the first time to a TV network so the Brady Bunch cast could actually build the inside as a TV show because the inside didn't look like it did on the show. That was a set. Uh, they right. only used the outside. So it was uh, a TV show they they did. And then it sat for a couple of years. It's in my neighborhood, actually. I walk by it every day with my dog. And then um, they put it up for sale. And they had 24-hour security there. It's the second most photographed house other than the White House in the uh, U.S. <laughs> That's amazing. Second to the White House. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. You know, somebody wow. bought that. A lady bought that. And it's like, you know, if I got a lot of money, I still wouldn't buy it because there's just people out in front of your house uh. at the time. Yeah, you would never. But well, but at one point, I swear, like when it was first sold, because it changed hands like more than once in the past few years. But I read that at one point somebody was considering doing like an Airbnb type deal with it where you could like stay in it. You know, yeah. I don't know if that ever actually happened. Well, that was my idea. Buy it and have it as like, uh, you could have like, say, Rolex wanted to debut a new watch. They'd have a, a private party in there. You'd be in the Brady Bunch house with some rad new Rolex or, or you know, Louis Vuitton. Any kind of brands could have right. parties in there. You could have movie release parties in there. Everything. Yeah. 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 It's, it's definitely, there's a lot of angles to it for sure. I don't know. If anybody's pursued that but yeah you could never actually live there because it would just be non-stop harassment you know yeah oh yeah your neighbors would hate you you know all right are you in the garage i see a a, a challenger back there is that like a red eye or something it's a demon yeah demon. yeah the demon that's the that's the 2018 demon they made three thousand of those for the u.s market and 300 for canada and that thing was, at the time, it may still be, but uh, at the time, it was a, the most powerful and fastest muscle car ever created. And, you know, it was made for drag racing and uh, did like, you know, the quarter mile in 9.6 seconds, 9.65, and I think zero to 60 in like 2.3 seconds or something crazy. And, you know, there's like all kinds of amazing stuff about that car. That's number 18 out of uh, 3,000. And then they've got, Another one coming out that they're they're building them right now. It's called the Demon One Seventy that runs off of ethanol fuel or E eighty five, and it's got a thousand. This one has eight hundred and forty horsepower on a hundred octane race fuel, and the Demon One Seventy has a thousand twenty five horsepower on E eighty five. Now, uh, you know, I think those had two keys, right? A red key to open up mm -hmm. all the way up. Have yeah. Have you taken it onto the track quarter mile or backwards yeah. wherever you live? No, I did. Most most people bought these and just keep them in their garage. And you know, I've driven this one's probably one of the higher mileage ones. I've put like it's got over forty five hundred miles on it, I think, at this point. So I drive it around here and there, and I I took it to the track before I moved out of California. We took it to, I want to say it was Irwindale. Um, I think oh, yeah. it was Irwindale um eighth mile track and you know i was just trying to get to know the car i went out there with hot rod magazine they did a story on it and it was really just like you know this is a real world um you know one day account of of a per of a of a demon owner just getting to know their vehicle on the track you know because they can do amazing things but it's not like it's not like a tesla where you're, you know, you get a Tesla Plaid and your great grandmother can get in it and stomp on the pedal and run, you know, a nine second quarter mile. Right. But like this is like a, a bonafide race car that requires some finesse 
and, you know, some practice behind the wheel to learn all the stuff about the car. It's like, you know, you have to work for it in this car. A car can do it, but you have to actually know what you're doing in order to put the power down and get the numbers that you want, you know. Is that manual or automatic? No, this one's automatic. Um, they never made any of the demons in in manual, but you could get some, you know, some of the Hellcats. And I think, you know, this is the last year for all the Hellcat stuff. And so I think they they're doing uh, a few um, like a limited run where they put start putting the manual transmission back in it if you wanted it. It's funny to think about Dodge. You know, uh, I had a uh, I had a Mopar uh super b b5 blue uh, mm -hmm. 70 and then i had a 69 roadrunner r1 red uh convertible 440 and mm -hmm. you know just loved mopar all my life and then when they made that viper when the actual viper came out it was yeah. so crazy right the dodge mm -hmm. viper like I'm, I'm there, a there, there's a viper on the other side of that car oh wow what what era yeah. This is a, it's gen five. So it's the last, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Oh yeah, I see it. it. I see that. Oh, that's the, that, that, now that's the one I like, the coupe. I don't like the convertible. I love the coupe, man. Just the way yeah. it looks. Yeah, that's the last generation. So they did those from 2013 to 2017. And then they killed it off for a second time, right? Um, but that's the GTS. So yeah, the, I think the most iconic Viper was the original GTS, the shape, you know, and I, I can't remember what year, exactly what year, but it was like late nineties um, when they first came up with that GTS profile. And so then when they did the gen five, they brought the GTS back and the silhouette and the kind of the overall shape of the car was a real kind of throwback to the original GTS, but bringing it into the modern era. But that car is incredible. I mean, the only thing, I mean, I just come out here and stare at that thing. It's just like, so it's just amazing to me. It's like an American exotic car and uh, you know, there's nothing about it that feels dated except for, you know, the interface, like the navigation system and all that stuff. But you get in that car, you look at that car from every angle. I mean, there's a car could be a brand new vehicle. They just can't, I mean, it's a, the, the, the styling of it is timeless. They got it so right on the gen five, vipers and then was sad to see them kill it off and, and i was hoping you know the viper people like i think they're all about the v10 but when they came out with that hellcat motor i mean that that v10 and that viper is 640 horsepower i got 840 horsepower in the demon right there right but the viper is probably a thousand pounds lighter than that demon so i was going man if they could put that supercharged v8 hellcat with like 700 or 800 horsepower in a viper it would be unbelievable but you know they killed it off they didn't do that maybe they'll bring it back as some sort of electric or electric hybrid you know crazy exotic car i don't know but it'd be nice to see them bring it back it's such an incredible car i remember my buddy got one and i drove it the first year the convertible and it was scary, man. It felt a little squirrely. It was loud, and and it it did, it was just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, dude, this thing's you can crash in this thing, you know? Oh yeah, no, there's people. There's there's been a lot of people that have uh, the last thing they ever saw was you know, like that thing going running into something getting away from them like you know the, the original you, it wasn't until 2013 that they even put traction control in a viper right? right because and the only reason why they did it then was because it was finally federally mandated that all cars from that point forward had to have traction control right but they were like no this is like a race car for the street so you know you gotta know what you're doing or this thing can get away from you really quick. That's actually one of the reasons why, besides the styling and everything, is like, I do like the idea that thing has, you know, it has some safety built into it, you know, because, I mean, I can drive, but, you know, accidents happen and it's nice to have, you know, something looking out for you if you make a mistake. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've drove on the track out there in Vegas, dream racing, and I've drove some of the fastest cars going, you know, uh, Ferrari four five eight, uh, the GT two nine eleven, um, you know, Bugattis, uh, all of these. And man, 
you know, when you're going flying down the straightaway, you get up to about 180 miles an hour, then you come into the turn, you're oh, thinking yeah. God, you got like the 22 piston brakes and everything. <laughs> it's so it's crazy actually driving fast. It's crazy. As you get older, you're no. like, this is nuts. Yes, it is. I mean, it's an adrenaline rush for sure, but you know, the, but it, what that what what getting older does for you is that then you start to actually think about what if one of these tires like you know cuts loose and you know blows out while I'm going 120 or 140 miles an hour, or what if you know the brakes overheat and then you know you got serious brake fade going on and you can't you know you wait a little bit too late to hit the brakes before you go into that turn and you know you you can really play out all the scenarios where when you're a lot younger you just don't even think about any of that stuff oh yeah when you're a lot younger too you're probably drunk you know you're like yeah i, I, I don't care if i live tomorrow you know <laughs> i hope not i hope no. not hey man i grew up in the fucking 70s and 80s and that's just how people were i'm not advocating it i'm just saying <laughs> you you got in a camaro like no, i get it I, I, I saw this I saw this video on YouTube recently where I don't even know, you know, it's one of those things where it just popped up and uh and it was like from back in the in whatever year it was. It looked like it was the early 1980s or whatever, but when they were like you you had to wear a seatbelt and you could not have a beer in the car. Oh, with I you. saw that video. It's and they're in, and they're interviewing this guy, and he's sitting there with a beer in his hand, and he's smoking a cigarette, and he's like, you know, I just think that we know if I want to be able to, you know, have a, I should be able to have a beer, you know. What? <laughs> it's like so much has changed. I love it. He's and, like, this bullshit, man, taking all my rights away. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's real. But I remember the whole. I, you know, I can't drive fifty five, and you know, when I was a kid, you know, yeah. they tried to make. I think 55 was like the the primary uh, speed limit, you know, on interstates across the country for a while because they thought that was really going to cut down on on uh, automo automotive deaths and stuff, which I, I don't know that it actually did much because they went back to it. Now, some places it's like 80 miles an hour, you know? Yeah. Well, the cars got so much better. You know, back then you're driving something with drum brakes and, you know, you, you put on the brake, you're like, I hope this stops, you know? I know, right? It's just how uh, how much is it going to slow you down before you hit something? You know <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I can talk cars all day with you, especially since you play uh, with the Whipper. The Whipper is yeah. that Mustang he worked on for five fucking years. You know. I know, dude. Yeah, yeah. He's still working on it. It's a beautiful car, but you know, it's part of being a hot rodder. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the never ending test and tune. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another uh, another love of mine, of course, is guitars, cars, guitars, and watches. That's basically my uh, and architecture. Those are my loves. But uh, obviously, you've made your career playing guitar. And early on, I remember I grew up around that era, and so did you, where Stevie Ray hits. And then you have everybody after that. I called it the Strat and the Hat era, where Austin came along and you had like Doyle, Johnny Lang, you, all these guys came out as the new quote unquote member gunslingers, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. But um, it's amazing to see people like you, uh, just a long, great career of putting out records and, uh, and just, you know, didn't go by the side the wayside you know because it was really red hot for a little bit and then it went away people like you and johnny mm -hmm. and and guys like that have been making records for years and killing it yeah yeah i've been fortunate man you know we've got the careers going on if you look at just like from the time i signed my record deal well i signed my record deal 30 years ago this year like wow. this december it'll be a 30 year anniversary of me signing my record deal and in uh in 2025 that'll be the 30 year anniversary of the release of my first record so you know that's three decades of of doing this and uh that, that's impressive i mean for me i mean i i know what it's like i know how many people first of all would love to even just get a shot you know at doing this right and then the amount of people that want to versus the ones that actually do get a shot is you know 
that's tremendously different numbers, right? Very small amount of people actually get a shot. And then the amount of people that actually get a shot that then are successful doing it is even smaller. And then the amount of people that are successful for more than five years, then it gets even smaller. You know what I mean? And so we're going three decades, got a new record coming out November 17th, still making new music, um, you know, still selling out venues, still reaching new people every night. Like, you know, I asked the crowd, I'm like, how many of you guys are here? Uh, you know, how many of you guys have seen us before and you're back again, you know, and about half the room raises their hand and cheers. And then I'm like, how many of you guys are seeing us for the very first time tonight? And the other half of the room cheers. Right. So that tells me, man, I mean, some of those people might have been listening to my music for the past 30 years and they just came to their first concert. But still, that, you're still getting new people to come out and see you play live. Um, and then I guarantee you there's a number of those people that just still just discovered me and my music and showed up at a concert, right? So we're still reaching new people, even 30 years in. We're not just always preaching to the choir, but we do have a tremendous foundation, a fan base that we've cultivated primarily over the first three records that's been with us, you know, throughout the entire journey and has supported me, you know, uh, writing and recording the music I feel inspired to make no matter what that sounds like or what direction it might take us in, you know, and embracing, you know, the artistry of it all. And then, uh, and just showing up for us, man. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And a lot of shit's changed. Um, you know, there was a record that you could put out a record. Nobody buys records anymore. Um, that's changed. Uh, there's, it's like almost overnight, uh, mainstream rock radio, which was the primary format that would play this music on the radio kind of disappeared, you know? Um, so like you, you had people stop buying records and you had a lot of radio stations that used to play this stuff that then changed formats and became something else. And so then you didn't have a main, you didn't have a, a countrywide home for this music on terrestrial radio to turn new people on your music. So a lot of things changed over the years. Those that's just two of them. Um, but thankfully, man, I mean, there's no shortage of people that want to see this music live and people are still consuming this kind of music. It's just in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, whether it be uh, the blues cruises or uh, blues festivals, uh, we just had the crossroads here again, uh, Clapton. It's it's alive and well. And there's also a ton of new guys. I think one of the greatest right now is Marcus King. So yeah. you're constantly getting, I mean, he's 26. I met him when he was 20. And uh, you get young guys that come out and, it, it's awesome to see in the uh, a world of where guitar wasn't popular for a while. Now it's it seems to be since COVID back and booming again. And guitar music, uh, not necessarily like I'm talking about like blues, soul, rock. I call it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I did a tour with Marcus for two months, and they were sold out double night theaters everywhere all different yeah. ages. So yeah, it's alive and well for sure. Yeah, man. Well, the other thing is, is like, you know, we're, I think we're reaching one of those, it's, there's this cycle in, in music and it's just like, it's like clockwork. It just lasts different amounts of time, but we're rapidly approaching or we may have already been in this part of the cycle for a while, but like whatever the mainstream music is, has become so, uh, diluted that it all sounds the same like you know where, where you turn on the radio and you hear whatever the most popular you listen to the you know the the popular songs and you can't tell one band from the next because they all sound the same and they're all kind of doing this, whether it's the, the pop country or pop pop or whatever r&b hip-hop i mean it's all everything's starting to sound the same and so then people are going okay well i want something different and then they they start looking for something different to sink their, sink their teeth into. And that's when a lot of people start finding out and getting interested in, you know, American roots music like blues and rock, you know, like real rock, you know, and stuff like that. And they start finding their way and, and they start showing up at at our shows and listening to our music and stuff like that as well. And and then and then the next wave of whatever's next will come along, you know, um, that will be the new era of what's popular until that gets so saturated that then it all happens all over again yeah i mean think about that time where um you, you know rockabilly stray cats and you had all those guys zoot suit riot all that all that kind of music 
uh, like big band music was popular, like right in the nineties there, that was a wild scene, you know, at the same time you got grunge and you got like Kenny Wayne and, and, and those kind of guys. So there was like, there's been waves of different stuff that comes and goes. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You look back. I mean, the nineties was actually a really great time for music because of that, because it was an era where you could have, you know, people like Nirvana and Pearl Jam, you know, busting the door wide open on the grunge scene. And then you could still have like blues artists that were putting out records and selling millions of records too. And, you know, pop and everything in between, you know, it's like there were so many quality musical options, you know, out there. And it just has become more narrow um, as the years have gone by, at least as far as what's, what's allowed to be put out there in the mainstream, you know? At what point when you uh, first start playing guitar, because I always say there's a million guitar burners on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok, and I've seen it year after year after year, guys that are mind boggling. But at what point do you realize, and this is always, I say, the most important thing that you realize I better write some songs here because who cares after a while how great you are on guitar? Where is the song? You know, once Blue on Black hits, you've got a radio hit song. Do you start to realize, hey, I got to really get into songwriting? Because Stevie had the songs. Hendrix had the songs. Eddie had yeah. the songs. Well, no, no, no. I've been about all about the songs from day one because my dad you know, worked at a radio station. I grew up around a radio station. You know, my dad was the program director. He was the guy that chose whether or not your songs, your band's songs would be played on his radio station, right? And uh, we went to every concert that came through town. I, mean, I just grew up listening to all kinds of music, but in particular music that was played on the radio and became hit songs. So that's always been part of my DNA. And that's why, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the exact number of, I haven't um, tried to count and memorize it, but we, we've we had, a, I would say, a significant number of radio singles throughout my career going all the way from my first album to my fourth album, you know, um, and some of them, you know, Blue and Black being the, the biggest, which set records at the time, you know, uh, for how many weeks it was at number one on the mainstream rock charts and stuff. And so... I've always been about the songs. I've always been just as much about the songs and the and the vocal and the melody and the storytelling as the guitar playing from day one. Um, that's just the kind of music that I like to make. I mean, and not every song is that I write is is a platform just for me to show everybody my chops on guitar. You know, there's some songs. There's one on the new record called "You Can't Love Me." It's like that song is. I mean, the guitar solo is there just because it because that's what's supposed to be there in a in a in a band like this. But you know, the guitar solo isn't a moment for me to like wow people. It's just serving the the song more, you know. But the song is really the purpose of the song is the message in the song and the vocal. Yeah, I really like that song. Uh, I'm I'm friends with John Mayer. I, I like John Mayer a lot. Uh, and I like what he does also with some great songwriting, great playing. And, uh, you know, he brings it all to the table. And that song, as I listened to it on your new record, I was, it's called Dirt, uh, what is it? Dirt on My Diamonds, which is a great, yeah. great title. But it's a great, great song, you know? And uh, that's, what I, that's what I liked about you from the beginning because back then there were a lot of guys I grew up around the Mike Varney era and there were burners that just didn't have any songs. And the ones right. that did have songs are still here. And it's because mm -hmm. of the songs, you know? Yeah. Well, that's true. But also, you know, the talent, I mean, you, you can't, I mean, you can have great songs, but if like at the end of the day, I mean, cause like, there's a lot of like, I mean, pop music nowadays, I mean, they'll, you, you get people with no talent and oh, yeah. uh and they just put a song I mean, so that that to your point a lot yeah. of the times it is just the songs but when it comes to you know being known as a as a great guitar player then you actually have to have the skills to back that up too right and so the songs are a big part of it but you got to be able to wow people and like you have to be able to captivate them 
through your instrument, you know, because of like the, the arena that you've been put in as a guitar player. So you got to have the talent to go with it for sure. I know, I know Stevie was one of your guys, but back in the day, were you diving into some of the other like seventies guys, like Frank Marino and Robin Trower and all those guys? Yeah, man. Yeah. I heard all that stuff. Mahogany Rush and, you know, Marino and the Almond brothers and Skinner and, you know, Z, I was a big ZZ Top fan. Love Billy Gibbons, man. When I was a kid, um, I mean, just rocked out to so many ZZ Top albums. In addition to all the blues guys, you know, like BB and Albert King and, you know, Freddie King and uh, Lightning Hopkins and Muddy and uh, Howlin' Wolf and, you know, Hubert Summer, all those guys, man. I mean, I just consumed music, you know, as much. I mean, it was almost like a 24 seven thing. Cause even if I wasn't sitting there playing music myself, I was around my dad or in the car with my dad and he always had the radio station on to be listening to it to make sure, you know, people are doing their job and the playlist was what he said it should be because he created the playlist, you know, and all that stuff. So it was just like music 24 seven and all that stuff. I was like a sponge. It just absorbed all of it. And then it finds its way back out in, in the music that I write and make, you know? And so you hear a lot of these different, cause it wasn't just blues and it wasn't just rock. It was James Brown, you know, a lot of funk stuff, R and B jazz, you know, hip hop, rock country. Uh, every single genre you can think of was, was played around our house. And so all that stuff is just kind of in your subconscious and, and then it comes out. And, and this album is a great example. You hear a lot of different you know, we, that's what I've always done from day one is I've taken blues as like the foundation and then mixed it up with all these other, you know, genres that that I kind of soaked in as a kid and trying to come up with something that sounds new and different for that genre and push it into new directions. And there's a lot of that happening on the new record. Yeah, I listened to that Sweet and Low and it had like a Dr. Dre kind of that, dun, 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 you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's got a little bit of a of a California vibe to it. Yeah, I loved it. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah but I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, I grew up uh, in the birth of hip hop, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like my generation, we witnessed that whole thing. So even if you weren't a big, like I never wanted to be a rapper, um, but I grew up listening to that stuff. I mean, it, you could not not hear it, you know, if you were a kid in that era. And uh, so it's just kind of part of, of who I am as a result of being part of that generation. And so I heard that stuff. And plus, I mean, you know, those grooves, you know, I mean, that stuff is, I, I'm all, I am groove oriented, man. If you listen to my stuff from day one, I mean, it's all about the groove and, you know, trying to make people, you know, make their body move, you know, um, just to make the music feel so good that they can't help but get out there and dance or something like that. You know what I mean? Did you dive down the Dumble uh, rabbit hole at one point? Did you get into that? Yeah, well, I, yeah, he he and I became friends, I don't know, probably 15 years ago or so. And he built me a, a, about 11 different amplifiers over the course of our friendship and uh, changed everything for me. Like, you know, regardless, I mean, the hype is real. I mean, you know, the, it exists for a reason. You know, he didn't make the hype. The hype exists because of what he's capable of, what he created. But I mean, all that aside, it's like, I'm just here to tell you that, you know, I went from like having amplifiers that I used every night on stage and I would have to like have a combination of pedals and like stand in the right spot and hit it the right way and contort my body like this to try and get it to sound a certain way and sustain and hoping that it would sustain as long as I wanted it to or something like that, you know, and all this effort just going into hoping that the amp is going to do what I'm hoping it's going to do to, I went from that to like this man building amplifiers around the way I play my instrument so that they intuitively do exactly what I want them to do effortlessly. So then it freed up so much energy for me creatively on stage and anytime I'm playing in the studio or whatever, it just like freed up so much more energy and, and focus for me to put into the music instead of trying to do all of those things, just hoping that that note's going to sound the way I want it to. So just that in itself was just a tremendous improvement for me. You know, it, it changed 
the way that I was able to make music. Run me through that process. I mean, he's a, he was, he's gone now, rest in peace, but he was a notorious recluse. How did you end up getting a hold of him? And then did you go out to like Santa Cruz or whatever and hang with him? What was that about? No, no, no. He was in the Los Angeles area. So oh, right. uh, he, was, he hadn't been up in Santa Cruz for a really long time. That was like way long time ago, but um, no, you kind of generally meet him through a friend, you know, if you know somebody that knows him kind of thing. Um, and I had a friend uh, that was, that knew him and my name came up between the two of them. And I guess Dumble had said that he was a fan of my music and in particular, a couple of records of mine that I had done. And so my friend Sherman, who knew him, Sherman was like, well, you know, I know Kenny, I could, I could introduce you guys if, if you want. He was like, oh yeah, that, absolutely. I would love that. You know, I, and, and, and I've been trying to track him down for years since I rented a Dumble amplifier on my fourth album, The Place You're In, in 2004. And I rented this record, uh, this album, I'm sorry, I rented this amplifier and I was like, oh my gosh. And I asked the guy if I could buy it on the spot. He wouldn't sell it to me. And then he was like, I was like, well, I got to, I got to meet this guy. I got to find this guy. And he goes, oh, he doesn't make amplifiers anymore. And if he did, he probably wouldn't make one for you anyway. And I was like, what? Wow. So I couldn't, I couldn't find him until my friend Sherman uh, put, put us together. And then we just immediately hit it off and became very, very uh, good friends for the duration of our relationship till, till he passed away. And what models was he making for you? Was he just making specific amps for you? You said like 11 amps, like, was he just building different? Everyone was different. Yeah. Everyone was different. Like, you know, what happened was, is like, we started going down the overdrive special path and then at one point, and I should have done this. I don't, I, I don't know why I did. We shifted gears, but you know, at one point I had them doing research into building me a 60 watt steel string singer, which would have been the only one like it ever made. Right. Cause wow. I didn't, I'm trying to bring my volume down. You know, I've played three Fender twins turned all the way up to 10 for so many years. And I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to find a way to get that. I was trying to find a way to get that same sound, but at a slightly lower volume. So that's what we focused on. And so, you know, I, basically I ended up having these amps laying around various Fender vintage amps, a couple of reissue amps here and there too, that, you know, basically he would look at it and, and he, if you had an old Fender amp, I mean, he could do a number of different things, right? He could do a mod to an amp or he could do, you know, a number of different circuits that he designed, you know, but basically every time I gave him one of the amps, he would use only the, uh, he would use the, the chassis, so the metal chassis, and he would use the cabinet, you know, and that was it. Everything else, if the transformer was good, if it spec'd out okay, then he would use that. But everything else, you know, he generally would just scrap, and then he would hand wire, you know, fabricate from scratch his, you know, entire circuit. And so I'd go over there, and he plugged me. And every time you go over there, it's you're there for like a minimum of four hours. You know, it's just like you know, you don't go by for twenty minutes. And it was great too, because you don't want to leave. Cause like you're sitting there playing through the greatest amplifiers on the planet. Like, you know, he's got everything and you know, you bring your guitar and, and he would just sit there on, on, on his stool or on his chair. I don't know why this thing keeps going off. I don't know if you can hear that or not. I need to put this thing on silent. Sorry. Um, so he would, uh, he would put, he would sit there on his chair or on his stool and I'd be on the couch and I'd be playing guitar and he just plugged me into different amplifiers and he would just sit there with, with his eyes closed most of the time, just listening. And he would be listening to how I'm playing and how, my attack and how hard I hit the guitar, or how soft my touch is. Or, and he's also like listening to what it is I'm trying to get out of the amplifier, right? And so he's like assessing my my playing style. And then we would figure out you know he plugged me into an amp and it's like well this would be a great platform for for us to build you an amp off of you know and so we'll start with this and then we'll we'll go from there and then he'd start working on it then i'd come back when he had something that would that could be played through and then i'd play through it and he'd listen to it again and then he'd go back and make a few adjustments or whatever until it was done but basically you know the whole process 
started from him just listening and try, he could figure out what I was trying to get the amp to do. And then he would go build the amp to do that. Man, do you still use them right now? Oh yeah, I use them. Uh, that's what I use on in the studio, on the records, what I use out on the road. <clears throat> you know, I'm a little concerned though. Like part of me wants to like, I mean, cause I was like, I mean, I, I don't, I play these things hard, man. You know, they're not, you know, they're cranked up. And yeah. then I'm a little nervous because, you know, there's nobody that he didn't have an apprentice. So there's nobody like he didn't pass the baton to anybody. So like if one of these amps bites the dust, you know, it's like something, whoever fixes it is not going to be him and it may never sound the same. Um, so that's, that's kind of weighing in the back of my mind, you know? Oh God. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I mean, he's gone. Like you said, he didn't pass down. It's a lot like to me, like Eddie Van Halen, he's gone. And all of that knowledge and stuff he has is gone. I mean, his son has some of it, but I mean, imagine what was in that guy's head, you know, his, uh, you know, Dumble, a few people knew and the people that did know hoarded the amps and, and that's it now, you know? Yeah. Did you ever yes. get to like uh, Matchless and uh, like Mark Sampson and all those boutique stuff? I've played a bunch of different boutique amps. <clears throat> um, I've played some of the Dumble clones. Yeah. I've AB'd them, to be honest with you, with real Dumbles versus, you know, what it's supposed to be just like the Dumble. And there, it's never the same. I mean, it's not. Because, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is this. And I've watched it firsthand and I've told people this. It's like, you can get the guy, you can like, you can go get one of his amps and you can degoop it and you can look at the circuit and you can go, and you can try and copy that, right? But this man would sit there and he would have these capacitors and resistors and and bags full of them, right? And and he he created the, the schematic for the circuit. And he knew in, in his head what the values of all those things, what what the appropriate value, because I mean, you, he would go through a bag of those things and he would test them and he might toss 75 of those things aside before he finds one that's right within the spec that he wants it to be in. And that's the one that goes in the amplifier, right? But everybody thinks, oh, you see the writing on the little on the, you know, capacitor, or you see the numbers on the resistor or the color coding and, and that's supposed to be that, but they don't all read the same. And he may not have wanted it to read exactly what it's supposed to. He might have, might have wanted it a little less or a little more or whatever. And so he would search and search and search till he found one that was the right spec. And that's what went into the amp. I mean, just little things like that, or like when I watched him troubleshoot one of my amps when we had a problem and he's, He's got his multimeter out and he's like touching this and that. And he's looking at these readings and only he knows what those numbers are supposed to be, like what they're actually supposed to be. Other people may think they know what they're supposed to be, but you don't really know because you didn't design the circuit and you didn't, you don't know about all of the things that he had up here. So it's like, you know, you can like, I don't know. It's it's not like Legos, you know what I, I mean? It. It's not I like, it. it's not fucking, yeah. you know, connect the dots it's like those yeah. early Klon centron pedals you know the the centaur pedal you know everybody yeah. tried to copy that and it, they they're not the same that's just all there is to it you know and, right. and also capacitors and everything change uh companies change that make shit tube company everything so it all is uh fluctuates and that that's the the chase of tone mm-hmm how about the intangibles? Uh, how about strats? So you you, uh, you got any old great vintage strats like slab boards and stuff? Yeah, my sixty one is my favorite. But like you know, I'm sitting here staring at like this is a this is a fifty nine hardtail right here hanging on the wall. There's a fifty eight over there, three tone sunburst hardtail. These things sound great. Hard to I, only thing I ever do is I change. I always put Graftec saddles yeah. on so because I break strings with those old school you know, original style saddles. I just, I always break strings with them. Um, but these hardtails are underappreciated. I but, you know, when you got the strings going through the body, bro, that's a whole different level of resonance, you know, and, and those strings are like connected. They're more connected to the actual body of the guitar. You know, I love the hardtail. If you're not messing with a tremolo ever, man, 
why not have the hardtail? I mean, tellies are God, but it, you get the strap body and the pickup configuration, but with the telly strings through the body vibe. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I feel they're fully underrated. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody wants the tremolo, but that's a that's a special sound. You know, it, it feels like it gives it a little more tension on the strings. You know, so you do have to deal with that. I mean, I feel it more because I play eleven uh, eleven through fifty eight, so I play thick enough strings where you're going to feel you're really going to notice it but you know it's like it's worth the it's worth the extra effort for sure tell me what it was like to first play with the double trouble guys i, I know whipper plays on the new record and he tours with you and stuff but the first time you play with him it had to be just surreal right yeah man i mean the first time i played with him well uh well i was like was that 15 i think i was 15 I don't know if I'd signed my record deal yet, but I had a gig down in Antones in Austin, Texas. And so we got the opening slot. Uh, Bill Carter, this guy that um, I know. he's an Austin guy. He wrote, you know, like Willie the Wimp. And uh, I think he was one of the co-writers on Crossfire and stuff like that. So Bill Carter was uh, had the gig at Antones. They booked me to be the opener. And Chris was playing drums with him that night. So I guess Bill showed up and saw my set or part of my set or whatever. And then he came up to me and asked me uh, if I would sit in with him. And I'm like, and I found out Chris was in the band. I mean, I would have said yes regardless, but I was like, oh, hell yeah, you know. And so he called me up on like the second song and and then never told me to get off the stage. So I played his whole show with him <laughs> and they set me up. I was right by Chris, you know. And so I was just jamming back there with Chris. I mean, it was just amazing, like dream come true for me. And uh it's first time I met Chris, first time I played with him, got his phone number, and that's how we reached out to him when I was going in the studio to do my first record and asked him to come play drums on it. But what was so cool about that night is Bill Carter came up to me after the gig, and I was, like, thanking him for letting me get up and play with him and stuff. And he handed me some money. I don't remember how much it was. It, maybe it was 100 bucks or 50 bucks. I don't know what it was. But he handed me some money, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I you, you don't have to give me anything like this. My pleasure. It's just incredible. He goes, he goes, let me tell you something, son. Somebody get offers to give you money for playing music. You take it. And I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that was that was a class act. You know, Bill's a class act guy. You know, I met I met the whipper. Um, I'm good friends with Bill Burr. He's like one of my best friends and we tour. Uh, we're about to do Madison Square Garden. A matter of fact, Whipper was telling me crazy stories about the first time he did Garden, you know, all coked up and, and drunk and shit. He's like, man, I felt like a loser. Here's my dream and I'm all loaded, you know? Yeah. But yeah. I met the Whipper at um, Bill's Christmas party and he had just finished recording this record that you uh, are about to put out. And that was a while ago, man. You know, like yeah. I guess you guys recorded in LA. Yeah, we started it uh right before COVID. Right. And we were doing a lot, we were we were in the home stretch of finishing the record right when the whole lockdown thing happened. And so then, you know, there was still a little bit of work that needed to be done to it. Um, so I just put it all on hold because you know, nobody knew what was gonna happen. And turns out it was a good idea because we didn't do anything hardly for two years. And, you know, I just knew it was not the time to put out new music. So we ended up, I had a live concert DVD that we put out called Straight to You Live. I thought that was most appropriate because then, you know, people can watch a concert in the comfort of their own home while everybody's locked up. You know what I mean? Um, but if we put out new music, it was like, you know, that stuff would have been, it would have come out and, and they'd be over it and be waiting for something else. And we would have never got a chance to actually tour for that record so it was good that we held on to it so then we ended up finishing it up uh and and finally getting it out this year and there's and there's two albums actually so this is volume one dirt on my diamonds volume one and then there's dirt on my diamonds volume two that we don't have an official release date it's it's finished uh we just haven't chosen the date yet but i would i would if i was assuming anything i would think it would be this time next year that one will come out now you guys recorded in la what studio were you at you know what? I really should. I really should. Uh, should be able to answer that question. 
but I cannot remember the name of the studio. And I've done several interviews now, and I never, every time I do an interview, I cannot think of the name of that place. The, but the reason why is because they tore it down anyways. Like, the studio doesn't even exist anymore. So the, the name doesn't even matter because you couldn't go there and make a record if you wanted to because they they when we went in there they said this is going to be the last album ever recorded this studio this building's being torn down it's be, it's been sold and they're going to tear it down and build a high-rise condo and that's that so at the end of the day it doesn't matter but it was a good studio it served a purpose we had fun making a record there there you have it and you you moved from california where are you living now I'm in Tennessee. We're we're south of Nashville, loving life. You know, I I, I did uh, my first 21 years. I was Louisiana. Then I the next 22 years I was in you know California, and now it's I don't know maybe the next 22 will be in Tennessee. But we're really happy here, man. You know, and we have a big family. My wife and I. We got six kids, and oh. it's just a great. We're out in the country, and it's a great place to to raise a family. Six kids. You should have bought the Brady Bunch house. <laughs> no, right? We got our own Brady Bunch. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate talking to you. And uh, I listened to the record. It sounds fantastic. And, you know, anybody that the whipper, <laughs> the whipper, anybody that Chris yeah. plays with is just uh, the real deal in my eyes. You know, he's not going to play with any any garbage. And I saw you guys years and years ago. In San Francisco at the Warfield, man. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think it was the Blue on Black record. You know, that's how long ago I saw you at the Warfield. And wow. yeah. I remember when I was watching you guys, I was like, oh, oh Kenny Way at the time, it, oh, he doesn't sing. It was to me, it was like Nugent or Robin Trier, like, oh, they got a singer, you know? Mm -hmm. how, Chris <laughs> told me that they're singing quite a bit now uh, over the years. Um, yeah. What last question? What makes you choose that you're going to sing one and Noah's going to sing one? Well, it's really like you know whose voice is better suited for the song. Really, right. I mean, to, to, for me, I'm not precious about any of it. I mean, especially because you know, for years I didn't even sing any of the stuff, anyways. Right. So it's like it's I'm totally fine if I can't. That's how I got to wound up get, hiring somebody else to sing in the first place is because when I was a kid and I saw my record deal and I picked up the guitar and played the guitar, everybody talked about how I played beyond my years. You know, when I played guitar, I sounded like an old soul. And, you know, it was so surprising to hear such a young guy play like that, and blah, blah, blah. But when I opened my mouth and tried to sing, I sounded like a kid straight up. Right. Oh, yeah. And that was not that was not the I did not sing beyond my years. And that was not the voice that I heard for my music. And people were pressuring me to sing. And I still to this day maintain that if I would have allowed myself to be talked into being the lead singer in my band at that time, that I wouldn't have had the success that I've had up to this point. Um, and then Noah came on the second album and he did. He's done an incredible job. And then I started singing on the fourth album and then. Over the next couple of records, a little less, a little more, whatever. The last three albums, it's been like 50-50. Right. I sing essentially half, and he sings the other half. But it really boils down to whose voice is better suited for the song, you know? Um, because believe it or not, I mean, no can sing just about anything, but there are there have been some songs where there's just a certain kind of like, I don't know, I think it boils down more not so much to singing as it does personality. You know what I mean? Right. Because uh, we have very different voices. Song. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's just the delivery, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of that comes out of personality. And so sometimes my personality is better suited for the lyric or for the song. Um, and then sometimes his is. And, you know, sometimes his voice is just the right voice for that song, you know? And so it just, it's on a case by case basis. Well, I got to tell you, man, uh, it had to be an honor probably for Irving or uh, is off to sign you, man. I mean, that guy is a goddamn musical legend, man. So uh, yeah. Hats off to him for taking the chance for a guy that didn't sing. You know what I mean? He's right. going off guitar playing. And that's the kind of sense that that man has. And here you are 30 years later or so, 
uh, still killing it. So thank you so much and hope to see you out there, man. Uh, when you come to town, I'm sure I'll be seeing you somewhere LA or somewhere out on the road. Cause I talked to Chris quite a bit and it'd be great to come see you again. It's been so long. Right on. Uh, yeah. Well, absolutely. Just let us know. All right, man. Thanks for doing the show. And when's the record out again? One more time. November 17th, November 17th. They got some videos out right now. And uh, you got an Instagram or anything? Yeah, can, I think it's, I don't know if it's Kenny W. Shepard on there, if it's Kenny Wayne Shepard. I think it's Kenny Wayne Shepard. <laughs> Facebook Facebook and Instagram, that's kind of where we reside the most. Um, you know, I'm not the best at social media. It's like I resisted that stuff for a real long time. I'm a pretty private person, but but it's actually a really great tool. It's It's good to keep, you know, engaged, directly engaged with your fans, you know. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks for doing the show. Yeah, brother. Thanks. I'll see you later, buddy. All right. Have a good one.